And actually, Nicole, our moderator is having trouble signing in here. So I'm going to go ahead and take over for this session, which is just as good. Uh, <laughs> so it is my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Nicole Miller from the University of Central Oklahoma. Uh, and Nicole, I don't remember what your title is right now, but I know that you're basically over everything student success for the College of Business. And you also serve as an adjunct instructor for business communication at the university there. And she's going to talk to us today about not to worry or don't worry. There's a video for that. So so very excited, Nicole, to hear about this. If anybody on the session today has any questions, go ahead and drop those in the chat. Uh, I'll definitely make sure that we get those fielded there. Um, but Nicole, without further ado, you can go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Brad. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you all are seeing my business communications main, main page right now. And we are. Are you seeing yourselves? Yes. You, okay. Let me pull this over here. Okay. So today we're talking about videos and talking about using um, video in your classes so that your your class can have a have a more humanizing experience of, of what you're talking about and what you're trying to do. And so, like Brad said, my name is Nicole Miller. I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives for Student Success here in the College of Business at UCO. I have been teaching business communications online since 2019. I typically teach block two classes, so the second half of the semester, and then I'll teach for a full summer, which is basically like a block two. So I'm going to kind of take you through a few different things and really my, my hope and my objective of what you take away today is if you're using video in your class already, awesome. If you haven't really gotten into it yet, this is for you too. It's for both groups of people. And I hope that you can be encouraged to maybe create one or two extra videos for your next semester's class, just to kind of think through some of this. And um, I'm always open to suggestions and new video ideas. So please feel free to share as well. So first things first is this is the course homepage. And some of you that may have seen me present last year may have seen this, but I do try to humanize some of the online experience by, by putting my my face out there and letting them know who I am. I try to be as creative as possible and show my personality for the class, like creating the header in Canva and, you know, having these different little, you know, ways to represent the syllabus and the course schedule and, and the weeks and, and just kind of all these different things to show them that I care, that I'm here, that I'm present. So today specifically, we're gonna talk about videos and I wanna start by showing some of the videos that I use in my class to bring that human interaction experience. And I will say that I, so I teach a block two, which is obviously very condensed, it's business communication. So they're doing a whole lot of writing and it's a whole lot of fun grading and, and all, that, all that stuff. But, um, I always do a mid-semester survey after they take their midterm and I get feedback on what's going well, what's not going well, because either I haven't explained something well, they've misunderstood something, and it gives me a chance to either course correct myself or them or both of us. And I always ask for feedback on what they're appreciating about the class and hands down videos is the main thing that they're mentioning. They're constantly saying that they wish all of their faculty used them. Um, sometimes it bothers me to hear that this may, might be the first time they've ever seen something like that. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, so my hope is that you can kind of feel a little bit more confident to use these. And I'm going to start now by saying it's awkward. <laughs> Unless you're like a, you know, like a, a media major, someone coming from a field that you just like love being in front of the camera and it's your thing and you're super comfortable. Um, I'm an introverted extrovert and I, I like, like the camera and I despise the camera. And the more that I watch myself on the camera, the more I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is so awkward. And so I've learned a few things over the years to try to make it less awkward. And I, I hope to kind of share some of those things with you as we go through, but I'll, I'll probably drop them in here and there. But one of the things I do before I start my video is as you're watching the countdown on the screen, I just smile. <laughs> I prepare for like three seconds ahead of time, I'm smiling. So that way, as soon as that I go live, I'm not fixing my face. Um, so I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm in there, I'm ready, like here I am, I'm ready for you, I'm smiling, I'm this welcoming face. And then while I am an, an animated person and I talk to you, 
I like to say to be a little extra. So even right now, as I'm presenting to you, I'm, I'm a little extra because I recognize that I need to be able to engage and interact and talk and smile and, and use my face and use my hand motions appropriately and try to engage with you and try to punch certain points or say certain things that make you want to keep listening and to stay there and to stay focused. And so I try to do that in my videos as well so that it's not just that they're watching a video of uh, I don't remember who, what his name is right now, but you remember from when we were kids and we would watch the dry eyes commercials and, you know, it would be very monotone and, and they just, they check out and they stop listening. And so I try to add some kind of value that maybe they didn't get from the syllabus, or maybe they didn't get from the assignment because we're not necessarily, some of you are lecturing and putting your lectures out there. Some of you use some of the uh, textbook materials and stuff. But I try to think like, what's the extra additive, like the things I can say off the cuff or what have you that, you know, they can't just read in the textbook. And so I really try to kind of plan ahead and do those types of things. This one I've had to work on a lot is pacing and uh, pronouncing well, pronunciating, because I talk fast and I get excited and uh, I have gotten better at that. But some of that comes with me having colleagues watch my videos and give me feedback and then being willing to be like, uh, OK, I'll refilm it because <laughs> um, I think that's the worst thing. You've probably seen your students film a video and you're like, man, I wish you would have re-recorded that. You probably would have gotten a much better grade. And so, uh, you know, I try to try to practice that as well. So let me um, also say one other thing. Looking at the camera for me is super awkward and I hate it. I totally lose my train of thought when I am recording and I'm looking directly at the camera. I always look at myself when I am filming videos and that sounds a little bit <laughs> narcissistic, but it is so much easier for me to look at myself. And then what I do is I pull my little, um, you know, tile of the camera as close to the camera as possible. So that way I am looking in the, the direction of the camera and I'm able to not lose my train of thought and to make sure that my face is doing what I want it to do. And I'm, I'm achieving, you know, really the communication that I'm trying to achieve with my students. So when I first start my classes, I have an orientation module within my course shell and UCO uses D2L as a learning management system. And there's a lot of different tools that you can use for recording videos. So one of the options that we have at UCO is something called, called Kaltura Media. And I love it because it, it usually, the one that you're seeing right now is not showing it as well because of the way it had to upload, but you'll see some in a minute, but it'll brand it with the UCO around the video. It will caption it for you. And so it's really nice, but there's a lot of other tools that you can use um, depending on what your university permits, like YouTube or Zoom or your cell phone or, you know, Screencast-O-Matic or, or whatever you want to use. So I always start out with an orientation module and orientation video. And this video appears in my module, but it also appears in my news feed on my course homepage at the start of the semester. So it's my welcome to the class video that I'm introducing them to the class. Over the time that I've been teaching, I have recognized that, well, or I've gotten feedback from students that a lot of them, while they may have taken an online class before, they haven't taken this online class before, or maybe they've never taken an online class before, and they have no idea how to navigate the learning management system. And so I spend just a few minutes, and this was more than a few minutes because we went through like everything in the course, but talking about where everything is and how to find it, how it's situated, how you use the Dropbox, how you upload things, the stuff that a lot of times we sit there and we think like they should just know how to do this and and maybe, but if no one's ever showed them or their student that's coming back to school for the first time and technology wasn't as, you know, <laughs> as relevant or as um, as much as it is right now for us, they might need a little bit of, of instruction and then they've got it. The other thing that I like to do, and I'm going to scroll down here for just a minute before I talk about some of the other things, is I give them a heads up about how I grade assignments. 
So I have a video in there about rubrics. And so I am a huge believer in rubrics. I think they're amazing and they are so helpful in pacing through your grading so much easier. And so I always show them how the rubrics work, how they can get an A on the assignment, what, what that is and how I grade them. And so that way they at least are familiar with what a rubric is, where it's located, how they can make use of it and so on. Next thing I wanna show are the, um, at the start, so the way that our textbook works is it's in five parts. There's 16 chapters total but there's five parts. And so for the parts, um, I, I break everything up by week so they know the chapter and the part that it's covering. And then I always have the objectives listed in there. So it kind of stays at the forefront of what that chapter or those chapters are about. And then I will do an intro to the part. So each part has a specific theme. And so I do my videos by those part themes rather than chapters. For you, your textbook may be different and you may wanna break it up by chapter if you, if you want to do this. But this is just my little brief opportunity to kind of give an overall summation of where we're going for these chapters in the textbook and what they can be thinking about. And then anything that I can add in that's just from me and not from the textbook as it relates to that content so that they kind of still get to know me and they feel like they're getting instruction from their instructor and not just the University of McGraw-Hill Connect. Um, and so it's really important to me that, that I stay active and relevant there as well. Then for every single one of my assignments, I film a video. I try my hardest to keep these things five minutes or less, but for some of my assignments, they're very robust and it is extremely challenging to keep it that tight. And so a lot of times what I'll do is for the ones that run a lot longer, I usually make it up to them somehow so that it's part of the course instruction that they're getting because um, with business communications, it's so applicable and it's very, um, you know, it's, it's not like as much theory as it is like, you know, you, you can see how that applies, like you're, you're watching that happen every day. And so I do my best to use opportunities to where I can give them kind of some of those nuggets of wisdom and stuff within those assignments and also help explain why I'm asking them to do what I'm asking them to do in the assignments and what the overall purpose is or for my class when they will see this again and, and why it's being done that way. So, like I said, each assignment will have a video. If there's quizzes, I give them that video. Um, like I said, I use McGraw-Hill Connect. And so some of the complaints from students will be like, the smart book activities are way too long. And I'm like, listen, <laughs> here's why they're long. One, we're not in class. And so there has to be an, a chance for us to give you enough content that it warrants the seat time required to be in this class. And so here's the reasons why. So I do a video at the start of the semester about McGraw-Hill Connect and how we're using the smart book and why it's relevant and, you know, how they're going to be using that and how their money is going to be, you know, <laughs> worth what they pay for using the textbook and the tools and, and how they can use it after and stuff. So I always try to make sure that I have these videos for them. And, and like I was telling you, this is that Kaltura where our university allows it to, you know, have the branding and stuff. And then there's captions available. Just word on the captions. Um, they are helpful for students who definitely need them. And for even students who may not necessarily need captions, but it's, it's helpful for them and they're learning to see words while they're watching a video as well. Kaltura does caption for us, but please always go in and double check your captions because every once in a while um, it will write something that I did not say. And um, that always makes me panic a little bit because I never know what it's going to like hear or, or pick up that may be misconstrued. And so go back through and look at your captions and make sure that they're there as you want them to be. So those are kind of the assignment videos and I have a ton of assignments in this class. And like I said, I have videos for every one of the assignments as well as like the smart books, the, the quizzes, like anything that I'm grading them on, there's a video for that. I use videos in other ways in this class too. So I really like memes and photos of things and stuff because usually in a news feed, um, it breaks up 
the the wording and I try to find something creative or funny or whatever to be relevant with the message. And so this was a video that I filmed in a different semester, but I let them know that as I watched that video, so one of my nuggets is save your videos because there's a good chance if you teach the same class over and over, students are gonna make the same mistakes over and over. And that video may still be relevant, but I always don't feel good about just putting it out there without telling them like, I filmed this before, but you need to understand it's still relevant, here's why, so that they know that I didn't just like set it up on autopilot. I always will re-watch that video before I send it to make sure that it still makes sense. And if there's anything that I say in the video that's maybe not true to what that class did, then I may either refilm the video or give a little bit of information about that section of the video and maybe why it's relevant. So this I use with videos for overall class feedback. So I will grade an assignment and I will give every student individual written feedback in like a notes section. And then I'll also use the rubric and sometimes I'll write on the rubric as well. So I do a combination of all of those things on every assignment for them. I will keep a notepad next to me as I'm grading to note common things that they are all sort of doing or not doing well or doing well or whatever. And then I will provide written feedback to them um, for some of those things. This was a video discussion, so a little bit different, but I'll provide written feedback for those. And then on some of them, I'll also give overall class feedback in a video form. So that way they see me and they know that I'm, I'm watching and I'm giving them feedback and I'm doing those types of things. Individual feedback is also possible, at least in our learning management system. And, and I'm sure that it is for others. It just depends on what options you have to re record. So we do a, a professional interview project at the end of the semester and students have to interview a professional and then basically present on a career field and also um, uh, do like an oral presentation and record it. And so for me, sometimes I like to give them recorded individual feedback so that I can address all of the different things and, and kind of like wrap them up at the end of the semester. I don't achieve it every semester, depending on where we're at in the semester and, and, you know, when all the grades are due and everything. But that's a really nice touch, too, that I've done from time to time is individual feedback. I will film videos and post them if they are mentioning things that they're having issues with. Um, one may mention it only, but chances are more than one have the same question. And so I may film how to do something or how that looks. And uh, there's different tools like in Kaltura, we can do it to where they can see the screen and me or just the screen or, or what have you. There's a lot of different tools like that out there if you don't have Kaltura. But that's an option that I can show and navigate and tell them how to do stuff. This was another one that I did because I make them use Screencast-O-Matic for their presentation, but I want to show them how to use it. Um, another one, they don't know how to format Word documents. I'm a BCom instructor. I'm dinging them on it. And so I'm going to show them how to format a Word document so that it wasn't that I never showed them or they never knew. So I'm going to take a pause here because um, I have just a few minutes left and I'm going to shift gears quickly to talk about discussions. So I use a tool called Flipgrid. It's free for discussions in my class. I get almost 100% participation every semester. Um, and in some semesters, I do get 100% participation on video discussions. They come kicking and screaming, but when they see you in the discussion responding to them and I'm in my jeans and my sweatshirt or, you know, just kind of kicking back a little bit and stuff too and being real with them and open with them because it's meant to be just conversational and fun and, you know, uh, engaging and networking and, and all those kinds of things. They're more apt to want to participate. And so I started doing something new last semester that I really liked with the discussion posts is I just made them a little deeper. I wanted them to do more things. So this is just an example that they, um, one of our course objectives has to do with listening in the class. And so I take them through a listening exercise and a, you know, a video. So they've got some resources and then they talk about some things and then they respond to each other. So in Flipgrid, 
this is kind of how it looks. It'll, you know, these are all mine from past semesters, but I just created this one so I can sort of show you. But um, you can set all of this up to where, you know, you've got a lot of different settings and everything in Flipgrid to decide how many minutes this is going to be, because I know that we can't all watch 10 minute videos of our students responding and nor do they want to respond for 10 minutes long. Um, you can also set it up to who can respond and how they can respond. So whether it be text responses or video responses or however you want to do that, they can do emojis and thumbs up or not. They can blur their background if they feel uncomfortable about where they are. Um, and so I will. Um, this is just a test to show you how Flipgrid works for the person who's making the original post. So that's, they'll basically make this original post and then students will be able to come in here and click this button to record a video comment. And both of these are different backgrounds offered by the tool so that they can feel that sense of privacy. And then this is basically what it would be like if a student went in and wanted to reply to another student's post. So what, what you can do, and I'm just going to just quick show you this. This is from another class, but you can start to see the number of responses, views, comments, the hours of discussion or engagement within Flipgrid. The other thing that's nice is when a student responds to another student, that, that person will get an email that says, you know, this person replied to your video, and so they can go in and make sure that they reply. There's a lot of different ways that you can go about grading this, but this is, um, you can export to Excel. I, I stripped all the, the you know, names and everything in here, but basically you'll get the name, the display name, the email, if they wrote any titles, you know, when it was created, um, they'll give you the replies, who they replied to, how long it was. It'll even give you any of their private sharing links if they had them. Um, and it will, sorry, I can't move this enough, but it will also give you a transcript if you prefer to look at a transcript of what they said instead of watching all of the videos and stuff too. So that way you can tally up because I make them do an original post and then follow up posts as well. So this is really nice, like I said, because it allows students to just kind of engage in some more fun types of discussion, but I just wanted their engagement with the course objectives we didn't have time in the class with all the objectives we have to continue to add more assignments. And so because we wanted to do discussion, I put those objectives within our discussion assignments. So like one was active listening and one was evaluating culture. And so um, they'll for the next assignment they do, they, they evaluate the culture of a company that they're interested in and they talk about it and they share. And then that also gives others the opportunity to kind of learn about other companies and other cultures as a way to, to just think like, oh, I never thought that, that I didn't know that company did that. That's really cool. Like maybe I'll look into wanting to um, work for them someday. So that's really kind of the main gist of what I have to say today. And um, uh, one, one other final kind of closing thought just about the videos. So it's good to refresh them periodically. And, um, but it's also nice if you, if you can keep them general from the perspective that when I film the first video of the semester, like I'm my, I'm Nicole Miller, like my name isn't changing, but maybe we're going to change the textbook. And so I, instead of saying like, use edition four of the textbook, I would say, and um, you know, the textbook is listed in the syllabus, you can see the edition and that way I can reuse that video if I need to. So you're able to build every semester, some new videos in um, and not feel like you have to re-record 27 different videos every semester because that gets a little bit daunting. So I try to stay general where I can, but also making sure that I'm staying true to not just putting everything on autopilot. So. Are there any questions that anyone has that I can answer? There's been some good uh, back channel chat going on in the uh, conversation here, Nicole. And I, I think, again, a lot of people are agreeing with the strategies you employ here to try to engage students. I'll read one from here uh, from Simon that he's had a similar experience, requires video from his students each week. There's a bit of resistance at first, but they quickly start to enjoy it. And I think it sounds like a similar experience for the instructor role as well. You know, it takes a while to get over this effective filter that we feel 
Uh, and I, I almost typed this in the chat too. Like it took me a long time to get used to hearing my own voice on recordings. And I have to do that a lot now, particularly in this role, because we share Zoom meeting recordings, you know, 15 times a month out there. So I feel you there. But once you do it, I think that it gets easier. Uh, you get used to hearing it, seeing yourself, preparing yourself. I love the smile strategy as well. I think that that's super effective and uh, it's kind of like action, you know, on a, on a movie shoot there. Like you really do have to be ready for step one right there. And I have a question for you about Flipgrid in particular. Do you have any um, comments about the accessibility of Flipgrid? Like, does it actually caption the videos that the students upload or is there anything that they can do to kind of make the content a little bit more readable? I haven't dug into that as much, but I do have access to the transcripts. Mm -hmm. And so if you're an instructor who needs captioning, there's a transcript that's created, but I haven't looked to see where the button is and I haven't had any students ask me yet. Um, so yes, I think there's something, I just don't a hundred percent know what happens in that moment. Cause sometimes, you know, those, I mean, you've worked with captioning, sometimes it takes a minute for it to actually do it and process it. And so it's entirely possible that a student could film something and it not be ready by the time the next student sees it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know for sure. Um, I wanted just to that original comment, uh, mention a couple of things with what I tell them with posting rules is to, to be respectful, not to use profanity and to like, please be dressed <laughs> when you do these videos. I shouldn't have to say that, but you know, um, and I always will let them know, Hey, this is uncomfortable. I get it. The first time I was exposed to it, I went kicking and screaming. And then I realized like, how much I appreciated it. But the thing is, is if you're not willing to engage with your students in the conversation with them, those are just words. And so it's really important that you get in there and you look awkward and uncomfortable with them. I, I think that they appreciate someone who's real more than someone who just tries to look like they have it all together. Mm -hmm. And even though you are, you know, the authority and the doctor of the class or whatever, it doesn't really matter. They just want to know that me too like someone's there with them. And that's, in, it's, it's very important. And I think it's very important to being able to um, gain respect from your students as well, because every, every time we do the first discussion post and they see me engage and they see the feedback, they always flood the second discussion post. Like it's, it's even more. And so that to me, I think is just a testament to kind of taking that approach and, you know, getting in the arena with them. Yeah. And I, I think Melissa's comment in the chat echoes that, you know, it's great to keep it casual just to get people to try it uh, up front and leading through example is obviously the best way to start with that and not being perfect. And I, I think that's the thing too. Your, your videos are not going to be flawless by any means. You know, there will be hiccups in there, or, you know, something where you turn your head to look away and a dog or a kid might come into the picture, which is great. So it just, oh, I love it. Rhythm. Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, we've talked about, we've over talked about COVID, so I don't want to go too deep here, but to say, you know, the connection piece has been has been noted by students even more so since the pandemic happened in that, wow, I didn't realize how much I was going to enjoy this discussion and how much I needed to talk to people. And the thing that they didn't have to do it in real time was nice too. They could put a pause on it and come back to it. So I make the original post due by Sunday night and then the classmate posts due by Monday night so that they have an opportunity to engage with other students. And it's not just like, first in, first out, you know, like you see the, the early adopters of the discussion posts and then all the, those students are conversing and having great conversation. And then you have the Lone Ranger who <laughs> nobody responds to their video. So the one's um, at 11.58 p.m. Yeah. That's <laughs> I might have noticed that in my own online courses I teach. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know. uh, so Michelle, I think, also brings up a really great point, too. And I know that we're over time. We actually don't have a session scheduled from 11.30 to noon. So I'm going to entertain this one and then we can close it. But um, she says as a graduate student, which, again, you teach undergrads in the cold that are business students. Michelle's a graduate graduate student and finds that just as important, you know, for the notion of engagement there um, yeah. with online classes. And I'll tell you from my own experience of facilitating quality matters workshops, we don't develop the content for those. We just facilitate and teach it and provide feedback and grades ultimately to the participants. And I've received that comment from numerous faculty going through that class that they wish that there were videos in that course because it's 
trying to dole and it's not engaging. And we as facilitators don't really get to show our voice except through feedback to them. So uh, I think on multiple levels, it can really matter, including this video based presence, uh, if you have an opportunity to do so. And again, echoing what Simon says well, as well about showing that sense of authenticity, uh, humility, you know, sharing how you've grown in the same area as your learners. That's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Michelle, I actually was exposed to this as a PhD student. And I was like, I am like 30 something years old. Are you serious right now? Like, I'm going to get in here with all of these folks, like filming a video and then like our class thought it was cool to use the emoji stickers. And so it actually became really fun and funny because the conversation was engaging. But what was also incredibly interesting was like how funny you could make the frame that you, you know, with the emoji stickers and how creative you could be. And so I think it just, it kind of depends on the class, depends on the personality of the instructor. I don't mind that stuff as long as they're having good quality conversation, because we want them to have fun in class, right? Like learning should be fun. (laughs) Um, So. Any other questions for Dr. Miller before we close out the session here? Well, Nicole, thank you so much again for another great session. Uh, Again, the expo spaces will be open on and off during the lunch period today from 12 and 1. Uh, If you have a chance, log in there as well and look at the resources that are uploaded. We have a couple of different grant opportunities that are available, one for virtual reality and the other for open educational resources. And Nicole, you can go ahead and hit the end button on the Zoom meeting whenever you're ready. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, y'all. Have a good day.